Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our students online. Welcome. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. And then we get into chapter four, overcoming inhibitions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity. And even as we learn about lifestyle evangelism and how to minister the gospel, Lord, we pray that you will speak to our hearts, minister to us, God, teach us your ways, give us your wisdom, and grant us, Lord, fill us with your power that we may do what you want us to do, Lord. We come at this time of learning into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So last class we looked at small chapter, yet very, very important chapter on power and love. So when Jesus ministered, he ministered in power and love. And so we looked at how when Jesus walked, he, he walked in the authority and he walked in love. And you and I as believers must combine these two and be able to minister to people. Right? Don't only use authority and forget about love, but combine them both just as how Jesus did. Now, let's get into four chapter four is over inhibitions the word inhibitions simply means uh, uh, you know things that stop us from sharing the gospel right S things that you know cause us to hesitate from sharing the gospel now how many of you have inhibitions you know I I don't want to share the gospel how many of you have that feeling? I have that. We all have that somewhere or the other. Yes or no? Others, wherever you want, you'll share the gospel. Right? How many of you, you know, you feel, okay, I don't want to share the gospel. I don't want to share. I'm happy. I'm a believer. Why we go through this, right? Sometimes we don't want to look at people. We don't want to talk. See, I'm an introvert. I don't want to talk to people. That's how I am. People say he's very rude. I don't know. By nature, I'm I don't talk much. Right? So there are inhibitions that we may have in our own lives. But when you and I, Jesus gave us a commission, he said, What? Go and make disciples, baptizing him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, this chapter, we're gonna look at what are some of the inhibitions, meaning what are some of the reasons that stop us from sharing the gospel with somebody? And also, how can we overcome those inhibitions? See, you have a problem, you have to recognize the problem. And then you come up with ways to solve the problem. Right? We don't recognize a problem and leave it there. This is my problem. We have to find ways to solve the problem. So in this chapter, we're looking at a few of the inhibitions and how you and I can overcome these inhibitions to go out and to minister the gospel. First one, not knowing what to say. So you are, minister, you are friends with somebody, right? I don't know what to say. How many of you have felt that? How do I start? What is the first thing I should say? Practical thing, right? And it's happened to me also. I don't know what to say. So for many years, I'll just give the tract and just keep quiet. So I don't know what to say. You read. If, if you read, if you believe in Jesus, it's up to you. I've done my part. I have this problem. Not knowing what to say. Now, not knowing what to say, this is a fear because sometimes it's the ignorance of the gospel. We may not understand what the gospel is. Sometimes it is lack of knowledge or understanding of what Jesus did in our lives. What Jesus did for us. Lack of you know, understanding of the gospel. If I know what Jesus did for me, and I know that he can do it for you, 
then I will I will be assured to tell you how God changed my life. Right? But one of the problems is we won't know what to say. The fear of not knowing what to say. Should I say like say it in a good way? Should I say it with a few words? Should I say it with many words? Or uh, when I'm bringing out the gospel, what to say? How do I share it? These are simple things. And so what happens is we say, OK, maybe I'm not ready to share the gospel yet. Maybe I need one more year time to learn how to share the gospel with people. So how can you and I overcome this problem? What do I say? I don't know what to say. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Very important, very, very important verse. Let's read that. First Peter 3 and 15. But in your hearts, remember Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Yeah. But do this with gentleness and respect. Yeah. So this is the classic scripture that people use in apologetics, right? It says, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord and be ready to give a defense or an apologia for the hope that is within you. Now, we're going to look at two words here. Very important. One is set apart Christ as Lord. Set apart. So that means no matter what people say, you are assured that Christ is your Lord and Savior, and nothing can change that. That is called conviction. Yes? At 11.50, you are 100% sure the bell is going to ring and the class will get over. Yes or no? Now, whether I continue or no, that is a different story. But you know, 11.50, bell will ring. Why? Because that's how it is. That's how the schedule is. When you are convicted of something, when you know that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life, you set apart Lord as Christ. Whether people believe you, whether they don't believe you, whether they accept you, whether they make fun of you or mock us, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Why? Because I have set apart Christ as Lord in my heart. So Peter's writing, he's writing to Jews. Think of this. These are Jews. These are people who follow the law, but now they've become believers. So maybe the Jews are not sure, how do I... Talk to people about Jesus. They know Jesus has been crucified. Now, how do I talk? So Peter's writing, he's saying, first, set apart Christ as Lord. First, understand that Jesus has paid the price for your sins. Set apart him as Lord in your heart. And then be ready to give a defense or an apologia for the hope that is within you. Two, two portions here. Set apart Christ as Lord, then be ready to give a defense of the gospel. One is a spiritual aspect. One is a practical aspect. Spiritual is you set apart Christ as Lord. Nothing can change that. Even if people come and tell you, you know, if you uh, don't believe in Jesus because it's all fake news or fake uh, everything is not real, it's all just a made up story, it will not affect you at all. Why? You have set apart Christ as Lord. Then comes the practical give a defense. So I need to read the word, I need to prepare to give a defense for the hope that is within you. So somebody comes and asks you, Why? What, what hope? What is it that you want to do? Why are you believing in Jesus? What is the hope that you have? Why is it that you're going every Sunday to church? We all go play football. Why are you not coming? What is that you go every Sunday to church? 
Why are you always going for prayer meetings? And uh, why are you believing God for healing? Why are you believing God for a you know better job? What is the hope that you have? Now, you and I must be ready to give a defense. So how do I give a defense? Be able to prepare. I must know. So we prepare and we practice. I need to prepare myself in the Word. I need to go back to the Word, right? So sometimes people have asked me, um, you know, wh what is this? Why do you believe that Jesus rose again from the dead? What is the proof? Now, this it's so important, right? That's an important question. And I must be ready as a believer to give a response to him. Now, that response need not be one very highly theological response, but it could be very simple. History proves that there's a man named Jesus. Yes? That's history. Christians are not writing it. Historians have written. There, was a, there is a man named Jesus. History proves it. Two, history proves that he was crucified on the cross. Historians have written. Not, I'm not writing. I'm not saying. Not even Bible. Historians have written. Three, history proves that he was put in a tomb. Now, you're not, you're not giving a defense from here. You're just bringing in simple pointers. History proves that he rose again from the dead. History proves it. There's history, historical facts. So what are you doing? You're giving a response where you're making the other person think. Now, we must be ready. We need to prepare ourselves to give this kind of a response. It won't come out automatically. Yes or no? Right? I have to learn. I have to read. I have to go back to books. I have to study. I have to try and understand uh, what the scriptures say and what other other books read historical facts, geographical facts. Right? We need to gain knowledge. You know, have you ever wondered? You know, I, I remember somebody asked me, "Why did Jesus say that you are salt and light?" That's a very interesting question. I, see, now is, is salt okay? Is salt available easily? When you go to the supermarket, you buy salt, you use it. But during Jesus' time, it was something very different. The salt was brought in from Persia, from India. It was imported into Israel and it was very, very expensive. So even people would pay by giving salt. You take this salt. As a deposit of you know maybe a certain amount, so you take it. It's so expensive, and Jesus is saying, "You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltiness, it's of no use at all." Now you can give a defense. You're able. If somebody asks you, "What is the meaning of salt?" and why why is Jesus saying you are the salt of the earth? You can bring in this. And so what happens is that person begins to think, oh, this is what it means. This is what Jesus is saying. You are valuable. And being salt, you know, you, you bring flavor into people's lives. You get what I'm saying? Right? So there's a little bit of research and work that we will have to do. We need to prepare and we need to practice. So not knowing what to say. Two. Feeling that nobody is interested in the gospel. This one, almost everyone feels this. Right? We're walking down the street or we know a friend. Everything is good in their life. They have a good family. They have a good car. They have a good house. They have good health. Everything is good. He doesn't need Jesus. That's a feeling that we think it that way. Right? The reality is that many people are longing for genuine relationships. Many people are searching for meaning and purpose in life. Now, our responsibility is to direct them to that meaning and purpose in life. Right? So don't, when you come across people 
maybe in your workplaces, when you go back from your, your hometowns, wherever you're from, don't put this as a stumbling block. Maybe he's not interested. Maybe she's not interested. No. There will be something in their life that when you minister the gospel, there will be something that will be like a seed that will go into their heart. Now, I'm not saying that every time they will believe, they will you know, kneel down, accept Jesus as their personal savior. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you are sowing the seed and letting God do the rest of the work. Right? The work of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we spoke of that. The work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. He brings the conviction. He brings the, you know, uh, he touches people's heart. Our responsibility is to share. So people are searching. People are hurting. People are looking for healing. People are looking for healing in the body, in the mind, in the soul. You know, I've always wondered, think of this. Bangalore is known as the ID capital of our nation. And I always believe that anyone who comes to Bangalore can work, earn, have a good life here. A lot of opportunities. right? And you can easily live a good life here. But do you know that Bangalore is the suicide capital of India? You ever thought of it? Why would you want to suicide? There are people who are working, earning well, have a good family, want to commit suicide. You know, there are some of them who are saying, God, I need a job. Please give me one job that I can work and earn. There are some of them who are earning, doing very well for their life, but they've committing, they want to commit suicide. Right? So feeling of, that feeling of nobody is interested, we should, it's a stumbling block in the mind. The enemy can bring that to our mind. So we should remove it off and say, oh, no matter what that person is, he may be a CEO in a company. He needs Christ. He needs the gospel. He needs to hear the gospel. Right? So remember that God has designed us as spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, we need something more than physical relationships. Right? We need a spiritual attachment. We need God. So wherever you are, you know, you may have friends, you may have family, you may have people around you. Don't come to the conclusion that they, they know everything or they have everything in their life. No. Our responsibility, we share the gospel. Right? Let's read this verse. Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Romans chapter 2, 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature do the things in law, these, although, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their heart, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else accusing them. Their hearts are bearing conscience to themselves. Right. Meaning, when we, when these, when you're in the law, you're bearing conscience to that. When you're out of the law, you're bearing conscience to that. So basically, what we're trying to understand here is, when you are sharing the gospel, you bear conscience to what you are saying. You're talking about the cross. You're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you are aware of the power that is there in that word that's able to change people's lives. Right. So. This could be one of the reasons why we stop from sharing the gospel, but we need to overcome it. Remember that no matter who they are, they're spiritual beings and they need a savior. Third reason, fear of rejection and failure. This could be the number one reason why we don't want to share the gospel. Yes, fear and rejection. First one is fear of rejection. What if they don't accept what I say? What if they say, no, I don't believe in this? Fear. 
how many of you have had that in your in your hearts many of us i have had it many times what if they don't believe i'm sharing what if they don't believe so don't need to share now remember that we can respond to rejection in a gracious way now i've i've shared with you many way many testimonies of me sharing the gospel with people and they become believers but let me tell you there are many many times i've shared the gospel and i've been rejected on the face there was this one time when a person came and he started you know asking me question after question after question i was not able to give him the answers he said he kept asking me did i win the argument did i win the argument i said you may have won the argument but you never won the soul i still believe in jesus no you can't believe i said no i will believe but i won the argument you won the argument but that's not going to change what i am no so we must learn to respond graciously when we share the gospel with others sometimes people will say i don't want to hear about it what do we say now don't get angry and say then you know what your future is lake of fire don't say all of that right respond graciously all we say is all right no problem i just wanted to share what how god changed my life i thought you would be interested but it's all right move on i don't go back home and start crying and weeping and say god i shared the gospel he didn't like it move on don't keep thinking about it right rejection is part of the process when the lord jesus was doing his earthly ministry he was rejected jesus himself was rejected we won't be rejected he will be his own brother said he's gone a little mad he's out of his mind if he really is the messiah tell him to go and stand at the feast of the tabernacle and do what you have to do tell people you are the messiah why are you standing here people rejected him you read the book of john it is a very interesting book because all through the book of john jesus knew that people were following him because of the miracles not everyone believed that jesus is the messiah they wanted healing Ah, we heard about this Jesus. He uh, healed the blind, he opened uh, deaf ears, he raised the dead. If I want to be healed, what are they doing? They're following Jesus. How do we know this? After he died, how many people were there? How many people were there in Acts chapter in the upper room? Acts chapter one, hundred and twenty people. Where are the thousands of people where he took five loaves of bread and two fish and fed thousands? Where are they all? he is not the messiah rejected him remember there will be times we will be rejected now we may be rejected in a harsh way or sometimes in a very you know simple way like in a very soothing way gracious way people may say no i don't want to hear about it now they may have different reasons i remember sharing the trying to share the gospel with one person and and he said no i don't want to even listen to this and i knew there was some problem and he said i believed god for healing from one of my family members it didn't happen and now i don't want to listen about jesus i don't want jesus i don't want anything to do with god and i don't want to even hear the name of jesus now he's speaking from a place of hurt yet i had to be gracious at that time the wrong thing for me to do is to tell this person see now you have lost a loved one how can you behave like this you must understand what the, that's a wrong thing to say but i remember I, i just have to say all right i understand you're going through a difficult time but in case you want to talk about anything i'm here i can talk to you how do you respond graciously you take a step back sometimes it's fear of ridicule there are many stories of ridiculers who came later uh who later came to jesus right people who will ridicule you make fun of you mock you they will they will look at they will mock you it's part of the story it's part of the process right but we learn to respond graciously 
So you just move on. Right? What did Jesus say? Jesus, in one of the verses, it says that Jesus was astonished. He was surprised that these people are living in so much of fear and doubt that he, Jesus could not do miracles in that place. What did he do? He wiped the dust off his feet and he moved on very graciously. Let's read Matthew chapter 10, verse 11 through 16. Let's read that. Jesus said to his disciples, Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is the servant, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone who will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for the town. Yeah, verse 40 says, He who receives you receives me. He who receives me receives the one who sent me. That is so powerful. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. So remember, when people reject us, we can graciously move on, right? And if they reject us, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Christ. They're rejecting the one who sent Christ. So the mark is not on you. It's all right. Just leave it. Just move on, right? So I know some of us may be going through this. This is one of the things that can be, you know, fear of rejection, fear of ridicule. What if people, people make fun of me? You know, I remember for a long time I was living as a masked Christian. That means Monday to Friday I will do whatever I want to do. Engage in all the things of the world, live a very sinful life. Saturday morning, the Holy Spirit will come. Saturday morning, I'll become very holy. Why? Because afternoon is worship practice. We'll go for worship practice Saturday afternoon. Saturday night, extra holiness will come. Because you're in the worship team. Sunday morning, you're standing next to Jesus. Nobody can touch me. So go to uh, praise the Lord, Jai Masiki, all of that. Finish all of that. Come back Saturday afternoon after lunch. Take out that mask and keep it. I'll see you next Saturday. Monday to Friday, do everything you have to do. Yes or no? And sometimes it happens like this. But we are not so. We must not do that. Be who you are, wherever you are. Whether you're in the workplace, whether you're in your college, whether you're in your friend's house, your family's house, be who you are, wherever you are. That way, there's no pressure on you. Share the gospel. Do what you have to do. Right? Next one, being ashamed. Sometimes we are ashamed and we deliberately hide the fact that we are Christians from others. Now, this is not right. This is intentionally telling Jesus, uh, I don't want you. Monday to Saturday, Monday to Friday, do what you want. And sometimes we be ashamed of the gospel. What if people, you know, you keep saying Christian, Christian, you keep saying Jesus, you keep saying church, and then my friends are making fun of me. My, my, you know, all my football cl classmates are making fun of me. When I go for my music class, they're making fun of me. When I go to college, they're making fun of me. When I go to work, they're making fun of me. So better is just do what you're doing. Don't tell anyone anything. Just be a believer. And once you die, you'll go to heaven and be, in, be with Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Now, when we deliberately are ashamed of the gospel, Jesus is not pleased with that. Because Jesus said, he's given us commandments. He's saying, you go. 
You go be the salt and light. You go impact the world. Go and make disciples. Go and make nations. Make people, uh, make disciples of nations. He's calling us to do something. It's a, it's a call of action. Being Christians, being believers, is not a place of, uh, you know, just sitting back and relaxing. No. It's a place of taking it into action. Right? Sometimes we have to be we shouldn't, you know, we'll be uh, called branded as fanatic, or sometimes they will call us Jesus. They called me Jesus boy for some time in my workplace. So Jesus boy. Every time, Jesus boy. That's okay. People will call you, will ridicule, you'll be branded as names. But it doesn't matter. Don't be ashamed of the one who died on the cross for you. I remember one day. I was very upset. I was very sad. I was working in the corporate sector and everyone were making fun of me, like continuously. Once a while is okay, right? Continuously they were like ridiculing Jesus. You know, they would, they would, I don't know why they would target me. And I knew why they were tar targeting me because they didn't like who, uh, who I was carrying inside me. So they would target me. And they would say, I remember they would say, hey, uh, are you going for lunch? Yeah, but I have a couple of stones with me. They would say. So I know what they're talking about. And they'll say, Paul, you want to just ch change the stone into bread? Or you change the stone into a pizza? Yeah, they would say, they would literally say that to me. Imagine in the workplace, they would bring a water bottle and say, change it into wine. Then they will say, you know, uh, we, we have to feed more than 5,000 people in this uh, office. But we have very less food. What do we do? They know that means they know all the miracles. The fellow, I then I got to know this guy knows all the miracles. I made him sit down and I shared the gospel with him. I said, How you know all these miracles? He said, I read the Bible. Right? Now he's in Ajmer, he's in leading a church there. Right? The fellow who ridiculed and make fun. So the point what I'm trying to say is people will make fun of you, but you be bold, you be strong. You be a child of God, no matter what people say, right? Don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. And as all of this, you know, people were ridiculing me and mocking me. I went one day, the Lord led me and I was reading about the cross and I read about the cross, historical facts about the cross. And I thought to myself, I am ashamed of these two, three boys calling me something. And look at what Jesus did for me on the cross. That he was beaten, scourged, where they would put eagles. History says that they put eagles' claws, bird claws, at the end of those whips. That's history. They would put, you know, uh, uh, nails that have been coiled up, right, at the end of those the the claws to to, to the end of those threads that would hang out. And, it, and they were used to it. Romans were professional persecutors. And they would literally hit that would bring out the skin. And eventually, you can see the bones in your body. That's why the psalmist says, I looked down and I, can, I could see my bones. And then those nails, six-inch odd nails, drived into you have in the into the hands a crown of thorns that just went into his you know forehead and then blood out of that i'm thinking of all that now here i'm sitting in the ac eating kfc and thinking they're persecuting me i thought i went on my knees in the cafeteria that day Front of all, I think the, the whole cafeteria was, I went on my knees and I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Let all these people say whatever they want. I will never be ashamed of you, no matter where I am. I will never be ashamed of who you are and what you've done in my life. And that day till now, I'm never ashamed. If people say, you know, hey, you're Jesus boy, I said, yes. Can you change water into wine? Not now. Come another day. Can you uh, take five loaves of bread and two fish? 
No, I'll ask. Uh, I, I'll go buy you food if you want. It doesn't affect me at all what people say. Right now, you and I must be bold. Must take up that, you know, that that authority that God has given us. Right. Romans chapter one and verse sixteen. For I am not ashamed. For I am not ashamed of gospel of Christ. For it is power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, listen to me. This is not some slave who's writing it. Who's writing this? Who's who's writing this? Apostle Paul. Paul. Mm. What was Apostle Paul? Commander of the Temple Guard, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, studied under Gamaliel, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He had everything going with him. He had many credentials under him. But he, he is, sorry, a, he's a Roman citizen. And he is standing and he is telling them, hey, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm willing to give up all that I have for the sake of the gospel. So it's not like Apostle Paul was just saying something. No, he had so many credentials under him. He was willing to let it all go. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Now, even as we are bold and unashamed of Jesus, unashamed of Jesus Christ, we should not be rude or brash. We should not make fun of people. Now, they make fun of us. It shouldn't be like we should take revenge and make fun of them. The mistake I've made is I've done this many times. I've done this many times, but God has corrected me. Right? So we are not here to prove a point. We are here to share the love of Jesus and to bring them to Christ. Right? So don't be ashamed of the gospel. Amen? Right? If you are ashamed of the gospel, if you are ashamed of Jesus, go back, close the door, kneel down, pray, and ask God to give you the strength, to give you the grace to stand for the sake of the gospel. Will you do that today? Right? Anyone here, you feel that you have to do this? Do it. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but do it. The Lord is speaking to you. If you feel you're ashamed, do it. Ask the Holy Spirit to strengthen you. Okay? Next one. Fear of mixing with unsaved friends. Now, just because I'm an unbeliever, sorry, I'm a believer, now we have the fear. If I go with them, God knows what demons will come upon me. God knows what they are doing. Now, tell me something. Which is greater, light or darkness? This whole place was dark. You came on, you switched on the light. What happened? Darkness ran away. Same thing. You are the light of the world. If you go to your unsaved friends, it's not that those devils will come and sit on you, but you should be able to affect them. That's what it is. We must be willing to step into people's world in order to reach the gospel for them. Paul did this. When he went to the Jews, he behaved like a Jew. When he went to the Romans or to the Gentiles, he behaved like a Gentile. He says, don't let anything that we eat or drink cause separation in the body of Christ. And so be assured of this. You are the light of the world when you are called to impact others and not the other way around. So don't be afraid of where you're, where you're going. Right? There will be people, if you have friends who are unsafe friends, don't push them away. No, I don't want to talk to you ever. Now I've become a believer. No. Remember what Jesus said? It is the sick who need the doctor. The Pharisees and all these leaders came to Jesus and said, everyone are fasting, but you are sitting here and enjoying and talking with all these sinners. What did Jesus say? 
Jesus said, there's a sick who need a doctor. Those who are well, you'll, if a person who's physically well, he goes and sits in the hospital and the doctor says, what do you, what's wrong with you? You say, nothing. Why have you come here? Simply, I like to be in the hospital. I like to see the hospital. The doctor will put you in a mental, uh, <laughs> for mental assessment. Something's wrong with his brains. <laughs> If you're physically strong, you'll not go and sit in a hospital. The same way, when you are the light of the world, you will be impacting others, bringing light into their lives. So don't be afraid to mix with those who are, and I'm sure many of you are from different parts of North India. You will have friends who are you know, not believers. You're like, go, minister, spend time with them. Ask God for opportunities to share the gospel, right? And God will help you do that. Now, let's look at a few other excuses. It's not just my personality. Hey, why don't you share about Jesus? It's not my personality. I like to uh, lead worship. I don't want to share the gospel, right? But sharing the gospel of Jesus is not about our personality styles. It's not about being an introvert, extrovert, being all of these things. But it is about obedience to Jesus, our love for God, our love for people, and bringing people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's not about our personality. Right? It's about the gospel. So this is something that we have to overcome. Yes? We have to overcome it. We have to take steps to overcome. Two, it's not my responsibility. Now, there are many people that are evangelists. Let them go and do the preaching of the gospel. I am better off being a you know, worship leader, or I'm better off being a pastor. Evangelism, let them do. Now, it is all of our responsibilities. That's why in APC, one of the things that we always believe and we reiterate is that every believer is a minister. So we must be willing to look at it as my responsibility. I'm not saying, you know, we should leave our job, leave our families, go into another part of the world and start sharing the gospel. No. What I'm saying is, wherever we are, look at it as your responsibility. Right? Thirdly, another reason why we don't share the gospel, I'll just live a good life, maintain, no, I'll, I'll live a good life. I'll have a good testimony. I will get up in the morning, pray, have my breakfast, have lunch, pray, have dinner, pray, sleep. I'll live my life. My house, my family, my children, no. That's not what God wants us to do. Remember, God is calling us to do something beyond it, right? We need to see the importance. People cannot know about Jesus if we don't tell them. We have to tell them about Jesus. Right? Now, last one is the reason why people don't share the gospel. I'm afraid that people will ask me difficult questions. Now, very, very important. Listen very carefully. It is true that we will have many questions, even as we share the gospel, we will have many questions coming our way. Now, we may have answers to those questions, and some questions we do not have an answer. Somebody asked me, tell me this, if God knows that uh, Adam and Eve will eat from the tree, why did he put it there? Now, I became tired thinking of it. And I said, see, I don't know all that. I said. One thing I know, Jesus changed my life. No, you forget, you're going back to Jesus. Tell me why is the tree there? I said, the tree is not important for me. For me, my life, the way God changed my life is important. So I don't know the answer to your question. But what I can do is I can read about it. I can try to find out. I'll get back to you. Don't be afraid to say I don't know. It's OK. Remember, we don't know everything. We are not all-knowing people. There are some questions we may not know. It's okay. Say, I don't know. And then you can also let them know that I'll find out. And if I get a good answer, I'll give it to you. But because I don't know why the tree is there, it's not like I leave Christianity and go. Yes or no? Right? The tree is there. 
tree of good and evil. It's there. It's not there now. Whatever it is. But I believe in Jesus. That will not change. So then people may ask different kinds of questions. Why did God do this? Why did God do that? Now, if you have the answer, back it up with scripture. Give it to them. But if you don't have the answer, don't make up your own answer. You'll get into a trouble. If you don't know the answer, say, I don't know it. I'll find out and I'll let you know. But just because you know we don't know all the answers doesn't mean we don't share the gospel. Now, for example, for your 10th standard board exam, you studied. Everyone studied, hopefully, for your 10th standard board exam. Now, you, did you say, I don't know all the answers, so I won't go to write? I didn't study fully, so I won't write my 10th standard exam. Did anyone say that? Yes or no? You went there, whether you know, you know the chapter or no, you went to write it. Why? Because you have to write it. The same way, we don't know all the answers that the Bible has so many questions, but we are called to preach the gospel. That will not change. So make this declaration with me. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Put your hands on your heart. Come on. Say this. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have no fear, but I have the spirit of love and sound mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Declare that over yourself. Declare that over your heart, over your life. Right? So we close here. We'll come back next week. We'll get into chapter 5 on how to dialogue with a person that you're sharing the gospel with. Thank you, everyone. God bless.